All right, what is going on, everybody? Happy Monday. I'm gonna jump in here. Let's see if we got the live cranking on LinkedIn. Should start to show up here in a second, maybe if I'm lucky. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to push live. But um, yeah, everyone, looking forward to today's conversation. Um, as you can see, we have a uh, we have a special guest today. You know, we don't always do guests, Brian. Just so you know, like a lot of times, it's just little old me. You know, <laughs> talking about these different sales related topics. So it's uh, we're live on LinkedIn now. What's up, everybody? Thank you for joining. Make sure um, drop in where you're joining us from um, as we start to get settled in here. We've got more and more people pouring in. I think it's they saw you. They're like, oh, wow, there's, you know, there's going to be some, some different stuff here. So for those of you that, that don't know Brian, I've known Brian for a long time. Uh, Brian is, you know, go to market leader over 20 plus years of international success, leading, scaling, developing high performing revenue organizations um, with a mix of, you know, venture backed and publicly traded um, organizations. And, you know, him and I were talking a little bit back and forth on LinkedIn. I mean, gosh, maybe a few months ago. And then we were kind of kicking around a few ideas. And, and I think like one of the things that, that a lot of organizations, this idea of moving up market, you know, I'm, I'm obviously talking about, you know, in my content, a lot about how, what, what, what do we need to do to meet buyers where they're at today, right? What, how do we need to adapt our B2B sales processes to make sure that we're doing a better job of, you know, meeting people where they're at, et cetera. And I think there's a lot of companies that um, you know, they might start out, especially like in venture land, right? It's like, we just sell to each other. We're a bunch of little companies selling to each other. Then, we, then we're like, but we have product market fit. Um, and, and then eventually it's like, okay, what's the TAM on this again? Like, uh, is this really gonna get us to like where we wanna go? And then they start to realize like, hey, look, we've gotta start to build a real like true go-to-market motion. And sometimes that means we're moving up market right as well too and um that's what we're going to talk about is you know and i think like look whether you're a seller and you're like look i want to continue to get better and better and better at closing you know more complex deals and working with buyer groups you know that are maybe more disjointed um or whether you're a leader or in you know revenue operations and you're trying to figure out you know this exact thing or, or learn new tips and tricks about how to move up market i think today is going to be a really productive conversation so brian Thank you for joining, man. Really excited to, to have you and looking forward to diving in here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, of course, man. All right, that's good. Uh, let's see. Feel free, everyone, drop questions. Uh, drop questions. And where you are joining in the chat. Um, we've had some really good chat where people DM me afterwards. They're like, yeah, I just introduced myself in the chat. And then all of a sudden, like this guy, like DM me and, you know, for like a potential business opportunity. So. Yeah. We've had some good things, uh, good things happen in the chat. So get active. It's Monday morning. You know, you've got 26 minutes. Make the most of it. Be selfish. Um, and so let's talk about this move up market. And like I said, um, <laughs> if you're a seller, you can ask questions that are more selfish around, uh, you know, closing bigger deals or what this means. Uh, if you're a leader, um, I think, you know, there's always tips and tricks that people are doing. Um, you know, when we think more organization wide, right, and this might be more like leadership wide, what are some of like the big mistakes? You know, what are the things that you see? Because like, look, nobody's like, you know what I want is smaller deals that take longer, right? <laughs> like said, said no sales org ever, right? So the idea of like moving up mid-market to get bigger deals that hopefully close at like even a similar clip, but, but where do you feel like, you know, what are some of the big, I guess, like takeaways from earlier in your career as to, you know, how to either, you know, not get this wrong or get this right? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, you know, done, done this a few times, led the mic, you know, led the move up, up, up market a few times. Uh, and, and it ten, tends to be a lot of the same mistakes that are, that are made. Um, I think the first thing is that organizations, they, they don't bring that all in mentality yes. Yes. to moving up markets. Like, well, we're going to try this. We're going to put a seller, you know, mm -hmm. on a few big accounts, right? Or we'll run a marketing campaign or go to some event where some larger accounts are, you know, inevitably it doesn't work at least the first time. And then, you know, all, you know, forget it, you pull back and, and, and back to where you were. So that kind of all in mentality, I think is really required to do this. And that, you know, that takes both time and money. Uh, and patience, um, and and I don't know if organizations always truly understand. I think they they're looking for that instant gratification when they move up market. Sometimes that happens, but rarely it, uh, does it work that way. And and yeah. 
you know, organizations, I think will often pull back because they're not getting that instant gratification. So I see, I see that a lot. Um, I think being really honest about your talent, I think you'll have generally usually have some folks in your work yes. that maybe have worked up markets, sold up markets, served up market customers can make that transition. That's great. Most probably haven't. Uh, and maybe some have the ability to do so, but if you don't have the right infrastructure, coaching, you know, uh, you know, sales enablement, it's, you know, for those folks, you know, they are not going to do well. So really yeah. being honest about your talent, being ready to bring in talent from the outside as well, that you can pair uh, with, with your existing folks that have worked at market, understand the differences, I think is another really big mistake that, that companies often make. They can, they can just go up market with what they already have in house. And again, there might be some, but, but you know, quite often uh, you need to bring in some new folks. Um, there are plenty of others, but those are two, two big ones. I love it, man. I mean, I can tell you that have to be all in is critical, right? Because, you know, we consult with hundreds of companies every year on various elements of their go-to-market strategies and processes. And um, it's kind of the same mindset I have with like outbound as well, too, which is like, can't be like, yeah, we're going to test it. It's like, you have to commit to it. Now, look, for some reason, the market might reject you. Okay. Um, and that's, that's okay. But I've never seen a company, you know, successfully make almost most, most pivots without having some level of like real dedication to it, yeah. you know, and, and that's a key part of it. The other, I'll tell you one other mistake I see um, as, as, as the, as you scale up market in particular, and, and I made this mistake, right, is as you scale up market, you think your TAM just becomes, you know, your total addressable market for everyone out there. Um, it just gets like exponentially larger. And what I actually found is one of the mistakes that I made is early on, I, I gave like the best of the best of these kind of going up market accounts to like the first few reps, right? So the first five to 10 reps that were doing that. And then as we try to scale to like rep number 30 or 40, the TAM wasn't what we thought. And, and I, what I actually realized is like, as we were scaling up market, um, I was actually artificially choking the new hires from, oh, from, from getting there because all of our, you know, first five to 10 people had all the best accounts. Right. And I, and you know, you think you're doing the right thing by doing that, but then you're actually hurting growth later. I know that was one I look back in my career and I'm like, God, I should have seen around that corner. Yeah. Um, I wish life worked that way, Brian, you know, where it's just like, you could just think and just see around corners yeah. and why, like, why is it, you know, it's like failure is like the, the, the main teacher, you yeah, know, it's true. Like, we don't, we just don't learn from our successes as much. Um, so let's talk about this next. So, okay. Want to be successful. I love both of those, you know, again, for those of you who are just joining, we're talking about moving up market, Brian called out, you've got to be dedicated to it. And then you've got to, you know, think about talent, you know, and that it's okay to bring in people from the outside. I think sometimes there's this fear of like, you know, culture or whatever. It's like, look, some of these reps just may or may not, um, you know, be as uh, like equipped, you know, to this or want to make that move. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about the outbound part of this, right? Because th that would be the other piece, you know, another mistake, actually, this reminds me, another mistake that I see people make is when they're, when they're lower market, a lot of it's like inbound. And so the teams are used to having like one very specific type of conversation where it's like, oh, like they already like know who you are. They're aware of the problem. And then as you go outbound and the people are like, look, dude, you called me, right? Like you can, the sales process changes dramatically. Dramatic. And I see a lot of teams fail because they don't adapt the sales process to, to meet them there. So maybe talk about like the outbound part of yeah. knowing market and, you know, all the different kind of nuances in there. Yeah. Well, and I think the other interesting thing about outbound when you go up market is, you know, more often than not, you're looking to displace an existing provider, right? right? When you're selling to early stage companies or startups or SMB, you know, they might be purchasing your category of solution for the first time. So, you know, obviously finding budget's important, but you have this added complexity, you know, usually when you go up market, if we're already using X, Y, you know, or Z to, to deliver the solution. And so you have the, the added complexity, added challenge of how do you prove you're better, more effective, the switching costs, et cetera. So, you know, even if you get that meeting from an outbound perspective, the messaging has to be a little bit, a little bit different and the value prop has to be different. And, and sometimes timing just has to line up for them to be ready to, to, to replace uh, the existing solution with, with who you, with what, you know, what you're bringing to the table. Um, I found that this whole strategy of, of, you know, near bounding and leveraging, you know, folks in your network or your executive suite, 
is becoming increasingly important to get that up market meeting. Like, sure, personalized outbound is required when you go up market. I think, you know, that's been said many, many times over, still holds true. But why do people not? Can I ask you a question, Brian? Why do people not do it? Like, I, it, it is it is the most inferior. It's, it's 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 almost literally the definition of insanity. Well, where it, it's like, look at the results. They're abysmal. Yeah. Then you look at the results of when we just dial back volume a little bit and we give people, we train the people and we give them the piece. Not to derail completely, but no, why totally. do you think, why do you think sales leaders and you know who you are continue to think that more is the answer even right. when it's not working well i mean it's it's you know in some ways it's easier right it's easier oh, to send, it's, send the same it's easier. email 50 times so i think that's a big part of it just do more that's required the coaching that's required um i also think person I mean, there's personalization and there's personalization like you know what what actually bothers me more is the personalization which is Hey, I see that you've been the CRO at this company. <laughs> I just got one of those, which, like one, you know, one yeah, one. which raised money a year ago, and you went to this college, and you worked at the, like, cool. You read my LinkedIn or scraped my LinkedIn. You know, you go that click deeper around, you know, why I might be in the market for your solution, or you know, folks that I might know that you were connected with. You know, and it's a warm connection. Uh, or competitors, perhaps, that are using my solution. This is how, and this is why it might be valued. Like those are the outbounds that generally get my attention. True personalization of why I, you know, the CRO at ThoroughPass might be interested versus the okay, you, you know, you read my LinkedIn and and a handful of other things of, uh, about my background. Um, yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. We, we call that Brian. Yeah, and, and that's I, I love what you called out there. We call that relevance. Like there's relevancy and there's like personal, it's like, you know, quasi personalization relevancy is like, look, what, what has still not gone out of style is I know what a VP of sales at a company at this stage that sells into this sector is going through. Yep. I know the trends in the sector that they sell into, because I can go to chat GPT. There's a million different ways you can cheat and get ahead now. Like that, Brian, I was talking to somebody, I get an email like that once a quarter. Yeah. Like that is how low the bar is. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I you know it, I probably get 20 to 25 outbound emails a day, like no, yeah. no exaggeration. And 99% of them are the exact same methodology. But like you can tell now when someone's actually typed out the email to you, you know, personally and gave it some thought. And I do try to respond to those, even if it's, Hey, totally not, not the right time or not the right person. Um, I do like to reward that effort with at least a response to know, hey, good. And sometimes I'm say, that was a great note. I appreciate that. Let's talk again in three months or six months or whatever it might be. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, the, I think that hopefully what you took away from this is like, as you move up market, um, more and more people are also moving up market. And so the need to be relevant or, you know, differentiated is key. That's what I would say. Um, and what would you say, like, uh, you know, are there any other kind of components of effective outbound as you're doing this, as you're kind of moving up other things, you know, obviously we're talking about, you know, I think it's, you know, part probably it's like understanding more of the trends that might be different when it's a small company versus a big yeah. company. I think that there's the complexities that you have to think about. Around. It's, it's you, probably, you, sorry to yeah. catch off. No, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably a different competitor set that you're yeah, going you up go. against, right? So, your competitors down market, probably different up markets. So who you're referring, who you're name dropping, your battle cards for your outbound or when you do get into a, a sales, you know, motion there, you know, have to change. I mean, certainly, you know, if you have a, a you know, a, a high functioning, you know, marketing organization, right, pairing your outbound with some type of, you know, account based marketing campaign or, or pairing it with some type of event you know, that you might have a presence at, even if it's not an exhibitor, you're there, right? There's just that multi-touch kind of strategy that's really needed to get that outbound, uh, uh, that outbound prospect, you know, on the hook. It's not just the world's best email. Sometimes that works, but quite often there are other things that are going through it. You're surrounding that prospect with all different pieces of information from your company. Then, you know, finally you get them on the, on the phone or they, you get that great email and they're like, oh, wait, I've heard of you guys. I've seen you somewhere. Um, so def definitely a multi-touch campaign paired with your marketing team, you know, uh, is I think really, really important. Yeah. I think that that's a good, good thing to call out. Again, it's, 
it's multiple again like calls we're seeing calls work you know and again the, the thing that i tell a lot of teams are like well we don't get as many people and i'm like look you know in today's day and age a a, a a call like if you leave a voicemail that's the same as like sending somebody a text message right because like nobody you know most people don't listen to their voicemails or lots of people don't if you as leave, a part of this and by the way if you leave a voicemail please say the company that you're calling from and why uh, this strategy of, Hey, Brian, this is so-and-so just calling to see how you're doing. And, you know, you oh, know God. Give, me, give me a, I've getting, they don't even say where they're calling. They just say, call me back. I'm like, uh, I don't know what is going on here, but be relevant in your voicemail as well. A compelling voicemail followed by a compelling email that generally gets a reply. I know. Right. And it, even if it is, it's like, Hey, I sent you the email or, you know, <laughs> like, Hey, this is what I talked about in it. Um, and I just, yeah, I think that a lot of people, it's, it's really easy to say calls don't work uh, when you don't do it. Uh, okay, so now let's move into the sales process. Okay, so we've talked about outbound. Look, we just have to step up our game a little bit more. We've got to know who this new competitor set is. We've got to make sure we're being relevant. What are some of the things that you see, um, you know, the, the changes that you need to make yeah. in a sales organization to handle some more of this complexity yeah. that comes from selling in the, in the you know, mid-market and yeah. up? Um. Well, first, you're 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 probably selling now to a, a bunch of uh, buyers or or influencers, decision makers, etc. Right? You know, down market might be your one buyer. Maybe there's there's a budget holder, but now it's generally a team of folks evaluating your solution, and and they're gonna have differing things that they are solving for, differing challenges, differing questions. And you have to, you know, understand that going in, and, and obviously vary your value prop to, you know, whether it's the budget holder or the you, the day to day user, whoever it might be, and then who's also going to influence that sale, right? Whether it's the CFO or procurement or HR, depending on what you're selling. So just understanding the like all the players doing that organizational mapping that is required of, hey, here are the five or six people we need to get on board with our with this solution, and here's our plan for each, right? It actually takes like a planning out of how we're going to win this deal. It's not just schedule a bunch of meetings, show up, do a demo and cross your fingers, right? That proper planning and prep with your with your manager or with your sales engineer, whoever it might be, super important. Um, uh, you know, I tell my reps for big deals, like ask for the meeting in person. I mean, when I started off in sales, all the meetings were in person, right? Every now and then you had a phone meeting, Obviously, now we've defaulted to Zoom, and that's fine early on. But once you've qualified that opportunity, it's a real deal. I think even just making the suggestion or asking the question separates you from your competition. Just totally. even say, "Hey, Jake, would love to come down to Austin to like you know be there in person with you. I'll bring so and so with me. We can meet with whomever. Let me take you out to lunch." The, the, even if they say no, that just shows you actually are investing in. You're the committed. Yeah, you're you're, committed. you're into it. That's exactly totally. it. Like I and, want, I want your business. Yeah. Right. Like exactly. I want this thing. Exactly. Um, and it's just not have. I don't. It doesn't happen with me. Uh, I don't. You know, I rarely get that as a as a buyer. Um, so I, you know, I've been pushing my team in particular to, to kind of offer that again when the time's right. You know, for the first meeting, you know, probably probably not, but certainly as the deal gets further down motion. Yeah. Um, you know, bringing in exec sponsors inside your organization as well at the right time. It's critical. You know, so critical. It's, again, it shows commitment. It shows care. It shows them, hey, as a customer, you know, you're going to have our best people on this uh, on this account that actually ensure it's going to be successful. Um, I've been starting to bring in the customer success uh, representative early in the sales process. You know, mid funnel. Yes. Hey, you know, yes. this is so and so that you would they would work on your account. They work with all our other health tech accounts, exactly. or whatever industry. Um, and they're going to be here in the background right now, you know, so that once we do hopefully earn your business, we're going to kick off really quickly, you know, and, and, you know, lose no ground there. So, you know, it's a theme of just more investment in the sales process. When you go out market, bringing in different stakeholders, matching them with the stakeholders on their end, uh, and, and being willing to get on that, you know, plane, train, car, whatever it takes to, to meet your prospect where they actually are. I love that. Yeah. I, it's funny. I, I, I just feel, I mean, I don't know, Brian, do you just feel like, because again, all the things you're talking about, you know, these are a hundred percent, the things that we've seen, right? Looping in, because again, now and now, you know, you're not dealing with individuals, you're dealing with buying teams, right? Like there is no such thing. I, I'm, I'm a proponent of this concept. There's no such thing as one decision maker anymore. It just doesn't exist. You know, everything is done consensus now. 
you know, where that person who technically they're the boss, but you know, Susan's too low, two, two degrees lower. But if she says no, it's not happening. So is she the decision maker? Because she can she can tank it just as much as that person can tank it. And so I think that there's this this team concept. And then the other thing that you brought up too, this idea of like bringing in success early. We used to do that all the time because look at the the, the sales the the customer knows that you're probably going to go away, right? And so when you bring that success person on and, and even have the success person talk about like what does our implementation look like? Yep. You know we do that. We're we're the largest deployment partner for. Um, um, some of the larger sales engagement platforms, outreach, um, and folks like that. And so, you know, they bring us on pre-sales, right? So we come in, hey, this is what we do. And I mean, the close rates are ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you know, do you just feel like we've created too many like hard lines between groups that reps feel like they've got to just stay in their lane? Do you think that that's part of it? Sometimes it's look. Sometimes it's a it's an organizational failure, right? Because you if your yeah. CS sits in a separate organization than sales, right? Not under the same functional leader. Those things just become harder. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, CS, their 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 account books are too big. So they're like, I'm not going to pay any attention to an account that's not even been won yet, right? So that you have to also educate them of, hey, you're likely to deliver a more successful engagement. You're more likely to get that renewal, that upsell, whatever it is. If things get off on a, on, you know, on a great, uh, on the right foot with a great start, and that starts by investing pre-sale. So I think there's also, you know, some internal selling that you might have to do, you know, with your CS or account management, you know, partners on why it it's valuable for them to join uh, certain certain sales conversations or or be introduced. You're not going to do it for all, of course. It's got to be the right, you know, value account, and that that's a big part of it. But helping them understand the value to them, I think, is a, it, you know, goes a long way. Yeah, like you're right. Like, hey, look, let me try or even like, you know, hey, we're going to let's pilot this with this group. We'll agree that it's only these types of deals. I've even seen team, teams start like a, you know, once they get larger, like a pre CS group, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of is responsible. I, I think it's better to bring in the person that they'd actually talk to, um, you know, because they just it's just there's so much trust building. Right. Like, especially if you're once you start to get to bigger and bigger deals, you know, probably the biggest thing they're thinking about is like, can these guys actually pull this thing off? Right. Right. That's that's what's going through your prospects brain. And so that's yeah. why having CS involved is so key, because, you're, you, you know, it's not just you sitting there selling the dream. You know, yeah. you've got a team you're showing them like, look, hey, my team now, you know, and even looping in the head of CS, if it's a big enough deal. You know, we've had a lot of um, success with doing that and like some of the, the bigger yep. deals, like bigger, yep. bigger, bigger deals. So, okay. all right, man, we'll, we're running up on time here. La last point I'll say to the early point on talent that applies to CS, too. Right, your up market 100%. CS team probably looks different than the team that you have right now. So sometimes that requires bringing new people. <clears throat> yep, I love that. And and so the last question I have for you here is when we think about um, you know getting started, okay? And you know again we've talked about some of the things to be successful, right? You know making sure that you know you've done a really good job of you know training the team or finding the right people, making sure you're committed to this making sure that you're, you know, you're changing the way that you interact with customers, you're changing the way that you do that. Again, these aren't like necessarily foundational shifts at times, sometimes they are. Um, in your experience, um, like how do you think about getting started here, right? Like, cause you know, it's like, you know, do you need to have all the elements like in place, like perfectly? Um, is it more of an iterative trial and fail, but fail fast? I mean, obviously you gotta be committed to it. If somebody's listening, they're like, yeah, you know, we wanna do this, we're ready to commit. Is there is there kind of a few of these pieces we've talked about that you'd be like, look, Jake, these this is what I would focus on nail. Yeah. Nailing. Um definitely I don't think you're ever gonna have everything ready to go, you know, perfectly. There is definitely an element of iteration here, which is required to figure this out, right? Whether that be messaging, some product feedback you're gonna get from the market, which maybe you didn't fully understand um incentives you know from a comp plan like there's there's going to be a lot of learning early on right at, at, back at axiom we used to have this phrase you know go slow to go fast but then don't forget to go fast and that really applies here right like early on you're like okay be patient learn as you're going and then you know make those changes really quickly so that you can really attack the market so I don't think you have to wait to feel like, okay, the product is fully baked for all the upmarket needs. We have the, you know, we have, we have every seller we need, every, you know, customer success person we need, you know, the, we're at every event. No, I think you need to have seen enough from the market, right? You know, maybe at the top end of your SMB customer to say, okay, 
like, you know, that was a complex deal. That was a long sales cycle. That was a, you know, we won a, a deal from a customer, you know, that was a sophisticated buyer. You, you want the enough signs to know, okay, we believe we can be successful in this market. There are, I think, a few like foundational things you'll then need, right? You'll need a couple of sellers. Like I definitely recommend going with at least two, you know, to, to go, if it's one and they don't work, you don't know if it's them or if it's the market with two, then maybe you have a benchmark to know, didn't have the right talent or the market's not there for us yet. But definitely start with at least a couple sellers to do this and then, you know, specialize, you know, someone in marketing, ideally in CS, uh, sales engineering, if you have that, that can form this little tiger team to like kick off your up market strategy, run with that for, I don't know, three to six months, learn along the way, and then boom, then you can go big from there. But again, you need that patience. You need to know this is not going to be instant gratification. This is probably a one to quite often two year transformation that your business will go to until like you're firing on all cylinders. Yeah, I, I think that's a great call out. I think sometimes in like startup land, right, especially there's this like, you know, now, right? Like what's happening now and just understanding like, look, it's going to be iterative. You're going to look for like leading indicators, you know, as well too. That's one of the things that we always try to focus on is like, Hey, what are the things we'd know in the first three to six months that like we're on the right path? And then like, how can we iterate and, you know, go from there? Um, so from my, from my vantage point, I think, I mean, hopefully anybody out there again, and, and if you're a sales rep, just think, look, it's the same thing, right? It's like all the things that we're talking about are skill sets that you're going to have to go and, you know, continue to grow on and get better at if you want to move up, up, upstream. Um, because again, I think for a lot of this is like, there's a lot of similarities you're going to take, but this appreciation for some of the complexities, the ability of like, Hey, I'm going to have to just get a little bit more dialed in. It's not, I mean, and you can tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, I don't feel like for a lot of organizations, it's, you have to appreciate the nuances, but you know, it, making the leap from SMB to enterprise, you know, then I would be like, you know, that's going to be mon monumental. But yeah. I always think of these deals, it's like an accordion. It's like, you know, it's the same steps. There's like a discovery, an initial evaluation, a formal evaluation, a negotiate. Like there are these things, they just get stretched out. Yep. You know, there's like two more meetings that happen here or one more meeting that needs to be happening here. And I would just say for anybody, you know, too, it's like, just understand sometimes in these mid-market deals, more meetings can actually move things faster. Whereas maybe an SMB, you're used to just having a one or two call. And yeah. you're like, send them a proposal. Um, whereas like, hey, you might just need to get on the phone with some of these people separately because they're not going to collaborate very well internally. And I think we've seen a lot of success with kind of that mindset too. So Brian, any final thoughts before we wrap up, ma'am? This has been awesome. I think there's been just like a lot of really, hopefully really tactical takeaways that if someone's you know, CEO, you know, head of sales or even a rep where it's like, yeah, I could go do something here, you know? Um, you know, it, moving on market's hard. If it were easy, everyone would do, would do it and would be there. So just know that going in, that doesn't mean it's not going to work, but that patience is so key. Um, and I'm always happy to connect offline and talk with anyone who has questions about how to do it effectively. We'll definitely do. So. Definitely do connect, connect with Brian, uh, go follow his content as well too. So thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you everyone uh, for tuning in another great episode. We will see you on Wednesday with me and KD talking more about um, our bi-weekly AI Unleashed series. So um, Wednesday at noon, so noon central. So in uh, a half of an hour later than today. So make sure to join us for that. Brian, really appreciate you, man. Thanks for joining. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, everyone.